Shalom my friends, this is Max Joseph and I'm here because it is the 10th day of the month, which means that it is time for the top 10s. Today's top 10 will be my top 10 favorite movies of all time. But before I go into this top 10, I want to first congratulate Jackson Fleming on winning the recent giveaway. He guessed the highest number of my favorite female actors of all time. Mazel tov, my friend, message me on Instagram, Twitter, or Amino to claim your prize. So, this is probably my most requested top 10 video. And the reason I've been so hesitant with making this top 10 is because I don't know if the list is finished. The reason being, I personally struggle with finding the difference between what I consider the greatest and my favorite. Like, cause what really makes a movie a favorite? Is it based on how the film is constructed? Is it based on how good the acting is? Is it based on the amount of awards it has? Maybe. Personally, I think a favorite movie has that, but more so it's based on how it makes you feel. That's it. Just because a movie is beloved by a majority of the population doesn't mean it has to be in your favorite movies of all time. In fact, spoiler alert, I only have two films in here that were up for best picture at the Oscars. My number three film of all time has a 20% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, a 59% audience score, and a 2.9 on Letterboxd. And guess how much I care? 0%. You know why? Because I love it with my entire being. That is what a favorite movie is to me. You love it no matter what. This is also probably the only top 10 video you will ever see me do where I will use the word masterpiece for each and every film. And you might be asking, why, Max? Chill. Why are you venting? Well, because I've noticed that people love to make fun of other people for their taste in film. And I'm not okay with that. Every single person is entitled to love what they love and not love what they don't. And they should be free to express that without the fear of being mocked. I have no shame in my top 10 and I know I'll get hilarious responses making fun of my choices, but here's my message. Feel free. I'm going to stick to these 10 because they're mine. And so instead of hating on other people's opinions, because that's what these are, opinions, maybe learn why they feel that way. Because there isn't a right or wrong answer. Maybe I'm crazy for thinking this, but I think the world would be a really boring place if every single person on the planet loved Shawshank Redemption. There's no discussion in that. We'd all agree that it's perfect and that's boring. Because that's where the conversation begins. So. I vented because when you post your top 10s in the comments, keep it kosher. Have fun and learn about someone else's taste in films because we're all different and that's really awesome. But before I go into my top 10, please make sure you like this video and subscribe to my channel and ding that little bell to get notified whenever I post new videos. But more important than that, please make sure that you are registered to vote. All you have to do is visit www.vote.org. All that being said, here are my top 10 favorite movies of all time. Number 10, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Miles Morales is juggling his life between being a high school student and being a Spider-Man. When Wilson Kingpin Fisk uses a super collider, others from across the Spider-Verse are transported to this dimension. So my friends, tell me if this sounds like a Max Joseph movie. Animated, superhero, diverse, epic soundtrack, incredible voice work, Beautiful message. What else do you need? It has everything I want in a film. I don't, whether or not it's animated doesn't matter. And that message, that's the, that's the big thing. The entire message of the movie is summed up in one line at the end of the movie. Anyone can wear the mask. You could wear the mask. Especially in today's world, it is so important for every single human being to know that anyone can be great. It does not matter what you believe, what color you are, sex, religion. The point is, if you want to be great and make a difference in the world, you can do it. How does Spider-Verse achieve that? Well, our protagonist is a young black man named Miles Morales. And for people who don't know the comics too well, it's probably the first time they've ever really heard this name or seen this character. So what does Miles Morales do? Well, he takes the mantle of Spider-Man from Peter Parker. Most of the world would know that name over Miles Morales, I would think. And Peter Parker is a white man. So, it is making quite the incredible statement when a young black man takes up the position of what is known to be a white person's role. That's huge. 
And the best part about animation, kids can watch this. And what does this teach kids? Be accepting of all people and be a good person. Kids watching this learn that from this movie. How incredible is that? And then you have Gwen Stacy, who was a total bad <laughs> spider woman, who also happens to wear ballet slippers. She's my hero. My friends, this is part of the reason why movies like Wonder Woman, Black Panther, Captain Marvel, and characters like Rey and Finn in the new Star Wars trilogy are so significant because A, they're amazing, and B, people feel represented and can see themselves on the screen, and the movie also is phenomenal, at least in my opinion. The script, perfect. The animation, groundbreaking. Like, we'll go down in history groundbreaking. It is just a freaking masterpiece that I have seen just so many times and will continue to enjoy forever. And sweet baby Moses, I cannot wait for Spider-Verse 2. <sighs> Last thing, Spider-Verse should have been nominated for Best Picture, and I would have made the argument that it should have won and become the first ever animated feature film to win Best Picture. Number nine that thing you do. The story is a Pennsylvania band scores a hit in 1964 and rides the star-making machinery as long as it can with lots of help from its manager. This is the first of the movies on this list that I just, I grew up on and I could quote on demand. And I think this is just a perfect movie. It has everything. It's funny. It's dramatic. It's romantic. It's political. It has some of the best music in any film ever. I don't care. I, I, I can't hear otherwise. Also, the acting is phenomenal. Tom Everett Scott is unreal in this. Steve Zahn is a comedic genius. In fact, I think I got some of my comedic timing from watching him as Lenny. His quick takes and bits are remarkable. And I know I'm probably the only person on the planet who thinks this, but without hesitation, this is my favorite Liv Tyler performance. She's magnificent in this. Yes, she's incredible in Lord of the Rings, Armageddon, Ad Astra, super, but no. No, that thing you do, that's it. And last but not least, Tom Hanks, who not only starred in this movie, but he wrote it and he directed it. Talk about a triple threat. This man is a genius and he puts on a masterclass. His range is unlimited. There isn't a thing he can't do. He continues to impress the world with each and every performance he does. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, this was probably the first Tom Hanks movie I saw either this or Toy Story, but I didn't realize as a child that that was him. Either way, he's perfect. The movie's perfect. And if you're wondering what would be near or at the top of my greatest songs written for a movie, look no further than that thing you do. Number eight, Hook. The boy who wasn't supposed to grow up. Peter Pan does just that. Becoming a soulless corporate lawyer whose workaholism could cost him his wife and kids. During his trip to see Granny Wendy in London, the vengeful Captain Hook kidnaps Peter's kids and forces Peter to return to Neverland. Full disclosure, I haven't watched Hook since 2011, but let me explain why. Growing up, my family loved, and, and still love, the story of Peter Pan and pretty much every adaption of it. We just gravitate towards it. Whether it's the animated Disney classic, the Mary Martin version, the 2003 live action remake. We saw it with Kathy Rigby when it came to Cleveland. I got her autograph. We all kind of just like, we gravitate to this tale of the boy who refused to grow up. And when I think of Peter Pan, I think a lot about my dad. So it's just a hard one to watch. But I, what I know is that I loved watching this movie with him. And it was my first introduction to Robin Williams. I love watching Robin Williams do what he did best, performing from the heart. He is my favorite actor of all time. And this is the reason why, in case you were wondering, he exemplifies greatness in this film. He shows off everything, dramatic, comedic, and my goodness, what a transformation this character goes through. Easily my favorite Spielberg movie, all of the magic that he brings in all of his movies is thrown in here. It's so good. Oh, the score by John Williams? I started listening to it the other day and I started 
crying, as I know nobody is surprised about, but I started crying because I was able to vividly remember moment by moment what happened in the film and watching it with my dad and my brother and my sister and my mom and our dog and it just fills me with so much joy. So I don't care that this has a 28% on Rotten Tomatoes because this movie is a masterpiece to me. It is perfect and I love it with my entire being. Number seven, Remember the Titans. After leading his football team to 15 winning seasons, Coach Bill Yost is demoted and replaced by Herman Boone, tough, opinionated, and as different from the beloved Yost as he could be. The two men learn to overcome their differences and turn a group of hostile young men into champions. My friends, I, if you can't tell, I have a thing for feel-good movies. I also have a thing for feel-good sports movies. In fact, you're gonna see more of them in the very near future. And with Remember the Titans, well, there aren't enough words to describe my love for Remember the Titans, because not only is it a feel-good movie, not only is it a sports movie, not only does it feature my second favorite male actor of all time, Denzel Washington, not only does it have one of the greatest soundtracks ever, not only is it endlessly quotable, not only does it feature perhaps my favorite monologue in a film, but on top of that, it's about race. And in case you didn't know, I'm a diehard sports fan. And what I think sports and movies have in common, if done correctly, they can change the world. And in Remember the Titans, football unites people that are different colors than each other. Through sports, these men who hated each other eventually become brothers. It's also based on a true story. It's not like they made this up. They just decided it would make an amazing movie, and it did. In fact, it made one of, if not the greatest sports movies of all time, and of course, one of my all-time favorites. Number six, Cool Runnings. I smile every time I say the title. When a Jamaican sprinter is disqualified from the Olympic Games, he enlists the help of a dishonored coach to start the first Jamaican bobsled team. We go from one sports movie to another, and this also does everything for me. It's funny, it features one of my favorite actors of all time, John Candy, rest in peace. And then unlike Titans, I can watch this one without feeling as emotionally drained. No disrespect to Titans, it's just a harder watch to get through. Again, based on an incredible true story, this movie is inspiring. Besides just being a childhood favorite and having seen it upwards of, I, I can't actually count how many times I've seen it, but I, it's, it's inspirational. I live my life by two phrases. The first, a day without laughter is a lost one. The second, never give up. And this is one of the movies that taught me how to never give up. These men who lost their dreams created a new one for themselves, and they not only made it happen, but when they fell, they got back up. And when they were defeated, not only did they get back up again, but they rose to something even greater, something that is more important than a medal. This story helped me live this phrase. I also really love Irv's story, which is John Candy's character. He has made huge mistakes in his life, but he owns up to them, and he works to earn people's trust back and to be an incredible coach to these men. What a life lesson to be taught in 98 minutes. I could watch this movie at any time of the day. Number five, Parasite. All unemployed, a family takes peculiar interest in the wealthy and glamorous parks for their livelihood until they get entangled in an unexpected incident. I can't wait to one day make my every single best picture winner ranked video because this is gonna be at or near the top. I saw this movie for the first time about eight months ago. And when I walked out of the theater, I said to myself two things. One, this needs to be nominated and win every award. Two, I think I may have just watched the greatest film ever created. Period. I cannot praise Parasite enough. I also say that awards don't mean everything, but this deserved not just to be nominated for every award possible, but to win each one as well. I'm still aggressively puzzled by the fact that not a single actor was nominated for an acting award. That is criminal off my soapbox. Parasite is obviously very different than every other movie I've mentioned before this, but it deserves to be here because I don't think I have seen something since my number one movie that I think about on a daily basis. And I'm not exaggerating. I don't think I've gone a day since November without thinking at least once, at least once, about Parasite. Bong Joon-ho's direction is magnificent. His script, perfect. The twist, Maybe the most shocked I've ever been in a movie. The acting? There's no comparison. It's some of the most in the moment, brutally honest and masterful acting ever. Song Kang Ho should have an Oscar for this, as should Park So Dam and everyone else in that ensemble. Thankfully, they got that SAG win. The score is perfect. In the opening, 
with just the piano. It's haunting. It's its own character. It sets it up perfectly. Every little thing was thought out. And like I'll continue to say, not that star rankings or percentages mean anything, but there is a reason that it is ranked as the highest ranking narrative feature film of all time on Letterboxd. Yeah, it's ahead of both Godfather movies, Citizen Kane, Schindler's List, everything. And fun fact, this was the last movie I saw in theaters before lockdown. They re-released it in IMAX right before, and you better believe I was there. Parasite is a movie that I could watch forever and I will continue to study. And when someone says the perfect movie doesn't exist, I ask very, very quickly, have you seen Parasite? Mm. Number four, the Shawshank Redemption. Framed in the 1940s for the double murder of his wife and her lover, upstanding banker Andy Dufresne begins a new life at the Shawshank prison, where he puts his accounting skills to work for an immoral warden. During his long stretch in prison, Dufresne comes to be admired by the other inmates, including an older prisoner named Red, for his integrity and unquenchable sense of hope. Speaking of perfect movies, You've heard me talk about this masterpiece since I started this channel, and I will continue to talk about it without fail. This is the second and final movie on this list that I think could be argued as one of my favorites, of course, but also one of the greatest movies of all time. And it is for good reason. Tim Robbins, Morgan Freeman, Bob Gunton, Clancy Brown all give the greatest performances of their careers. Freeman earned himself an Oscar nomination. And, like Parasite, I'm baffled at how Tim Robbins missed out on a nomination because he should have won that award. Yes, I know what I just said. That means he would have beat one of my favorite actors of all time, Tom Hanks, for his performance in Forrest Gump, which was remarkable, but that is how brilliant I think Tim Robbins is in Shawshank Redemption. Anyway, I'd also argue that it is in the top three best adapted screenplays ever. A lot of people don't realize it's an adapted screenplay. Yeah, it's perfect. Two-time Oscar winner Roger Deakins produced some of the most gorgeous pictures ever put to screen, let alone his career. Thomas Newman's music is its own character and moves the plot perfectly, and it has one of the greatest endings in the history of cinema. From the Ziwatanejo monologue to the end, that is, and let me say this very clearly, some of the greatest cinema ever. It just works on every single level. It works. It is a masterpiece. Number three, D2. The Mighty Ducks. After Gordon Bombay's hockey comeback is cut short, he is named coach of Team USA Hockey for the Junior Goodwill Games. Bombay reunites the Mighty Ducks and introduces a few new players. However, he finds himself distracted by his newfound fame and must regather if the Ducks are to defeat tournament favorites, Iceland. This one is probably the most shocking for everyone to see, but this movie defined my childhood. If you don't know, there's one thing that all my childhood favorites have in common. They all have this moment at the end where you lift your arms up in the air and say, never give up, never give up, quote I live by. And this was probably the one that did that for me first. When I was a kid, I wanted to be Charlie Conway. I wanted Gordon Bombay to be my coach. I used to practice the flying V, the knuckle puck, and my go-to pump up before any game would be quack, quack. Quack, 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 go Ducks! Without fail, it's my childhood. And speaking to just the film itself, sweet baby Moses, Coach Bombay's speech in D2 The Mighty Ducks is perhaps the greatest motivational speech ever. I use, I'm using a lot of evers because these are my favorites of all time. Anyway, the quote, when a friend needs you now more than ever, ducks fly together. When the rooster is crowing and the cows are spinning circles in the pasture, ducks fly together. It's gold. And then one of my favorite scenes, which I don't think a lot of people pay attention to, is when after Gordon gets all his sponsorships and his money, he has this moment where he has the chance to get his life back together. And there's this gorgeous scene of him skating by the beach in the sunset. And he learns that money isn't everything. And it's really beautiful and a great message to send to everyone. On top of all that, there's a great story in there. The stakes are high. It's not just a peewee game. No, they're, they're playing in the junior Goodwill games. This is big. And then the sportsmanship between the two teams is intense and has meat to it, especially between Gunner and Charlie. It's really phenomenal. Here's the bottom line. When it comes to D2, The Mighty Ducks, it is a classic. It is about friendship and teamwork, and it is the definition of a movie with a beating heart constantly pumping. And I love it so much. Number two, Harry Potter, 
and the Sorcerer's Stone. Harry Potter has lived under the stairs at his aunt and uncle's house his whole life. But on his 11th birthday, he learns he's a powerful wizard, with a place waiting for him at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. As he learns to harness his newfound powers with the help of the school's kindly headmaster, Harry uncovers the truth about his parents' deaths and about the villain who's to blame. So I was nine years old when this came out, I, I think. And I had already read or listened to the books on tape by the time this came out. And up until this point, I had never seen something as fantastic as this. Because this just, this, this just blew my frickin' mind. And real quick, can we talk about the cast? Skipping the kids because they're just magnificent throughout the entire series, but this has the late Richard Harris as Albus Dumbledore, Robbie Coltrane as Rubius Hagrid, Dame Maggie Smith as McGonagall, Richard Griffiths, rest in peace, Fiona Shaw, Warwick Davis. Y'all, John frickin' Cleese was in this. John Cleese. The cast is stacked, and they're amazing. All of that, plus the late, great, it pains me to say it every time, Alan Rickman. My friends, when I was a child reading this book, I imagined I'm sure like many of you did, what he was like. And somehow, Alan Rickman not only matched my image of Snape, but made it even better. That's rare, because when I read the book, then see a movie, I'm usually thinking, this is great. It's a little bit different than what I imagined, but that's okay. Not the case here. Alan Rickman is unreal in Harry Potter. He is everything. We move on. John Williams' score. When I think of the most recognizable theme songs from movies, I think about Jaws, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park. And you better believe, I also put Harry Potter in there. By the way, all of the films I just listed were John Williams. That is also why he's my favorite composer. This was also my sick movie, or the movie I'd turn on when I was upset. It's endlessly watchable, and besides this and my number one movie of all time, it's the one I could probably quote from beginning to end. All in all, I know it's super cheesy to say, but I love this movie because it's magical. It takes me on an incredible adventure every single time. It can take me out of the world during one watch, and then for another watch, it can remind me about how to be a good friend and a good person. Do you ever watch a movie and then realize, there's probably something I can do right now to make a change in the world? or even just in my life, or maybe acknowledge that I'm lucky to be here. Whenever I watch this movie, I text my friend because we always watched it together. So whether or not we've talked in a year, it reminds me to keep in contact with him. It also reminds me how important my parents are to me. That's the real magic of this movie. Because as a child, I didn't realize it would affect the way I go about life, but it did. Harry Potter is something I will have forever, no matter who wrote it, because it's mine, and it's yours, and it's all of ours. Number one, Avengers Endgame. I'm skipping the plot on this one because I want to make sure people actually listen to what I'm saying. I know that people are going to make fun of me for this, and I'm totally fine with that. So instead of me trying to explain why this movie is amazing, I'm going to explain why it's my favorite movie of all time. Because like I said at the very beginning, for me, a movie isn't a favorite based on anything except how it makes you feel. If you loved it, that's all that matters. So why did I love it so much? There's, there's so many reasons. But the biggest reason of all is because I have never felt the way I did while watching Avengers Endgame in any other film, on stage performance, literally any piece of art ever. When I saw Iron Man in theaters on May 2nd, 2008, yes, I went to opening night, I knew that I was watching something that I've never really experienced before in almost any form of entertainment, including sports. I was obsessed. I probably went back a good six times after that. I thought Robert Downey Jr. was brilliant. I thought the CGI was on another planet. I thought the storytelling was in their normal go-to superhero cliches, which I love. But it was something more rooted and had more heart than other films. Fast forward to April 25th, 2019, I couldn't believe it. This chapter was coming to an end. And I was expecting, like, perfection. And I got it. I got this epic finale that tied this perfect bow and left me sobbing until I fell asleep that night, woke up the next morning and went to go see it again, then cried all over. I love that this story was told in three parts. We had a more drama-filled beginning in Act 1 that really gave everyone some more meat that they haven't gotten before in the MCU. Then we had Act 2, which was all about saying thank you to the fans, done to perfection. 
perfection. And then act three, which to me is probably the greatest finale I've ever seen in my life. And without question, the most cathartic ending I've ever experienced in a movie, ever. To sum all that up, I love Avengers Endgame because I just do. I love how it makes me feel. I love that I can watch it on repeat as I have many times. And I genuinely also, and I mean this, I genuinely love that there are people who don't like it and even hate it because I love discussing it. In the end, it's my favorite movie of all time because I love it. Those are my top 10 favorite movies of all time. Let me know what your top 10 movies are in the comments. And so my friends, thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to like this video, give me your thoughts in the comments, subscribe to this channel, as well as follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at mjoseph492. Like my page on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash maxjosephfilmperson. Join the Amino live chat, which is open 24 seven, 365. And if you really love me, please consider being a member of the channel where you can get member only content, guest interviews, giveaways, and lots more. You can even give me a film to review, a 10th of the month top 10 category, a ranking, or a song to sing. And that video will be dedicated to you. Shalom, my friends.